BT is the oldest telecommunications company in the world. So we were there right from the beginnings of um, the electric telegraph development. The first company being founded in 1846 is our direct ancestor. And then we've been there right at the heart of telecommunications from that point to the private telephone companies, the post office telecommunications, and then the privatization of BT in 1984. Another of our threads is being part of the national fabric, so having national significance and just how strategic communications can be. So one example would be during wartime. So in the 1940s, the post office, among a number of other things, were involved in building um, Colossus, which was a code-breaking machine, um, early computer, that managed to break the German ciphers. And that was hugely um, important during wartime. That was actually built on telecommunications technology. So before then, you'd have the mechanical code breaking, and then they needed to use something new um, in order to do this so that the post office were involved in that. And then the things like infrastructure. So if you look at um, early telephones, you can see that the wires were all put on top of the, the roofs on these wire derricks, they were called. And um, that became quite unmanageable after a while. The infrastructure just couldn't support that anymore. Um, and then they realized they had to go underground, so they built an underground network. Then in the 60s, you have this demand for color television services, you have demand for increased telephone traffic, and then things like the post office tower are built because they can use microwave technology, which needs a clear line of sight. So that was why the tower was built, and that's why it's as tall as it is, so that it can clear um, buildings and surrounding hills. So it's just this idea of constantly having to move on your infrastructure and meet the, the demands and the needs of the nation that I think is, is reflected in our heritage. I think if we look at the past for clues of where we might be going, I think we know that we will continue to innovate, we'll push boundaries because that's what we've always done and we will play our part in national infrastructure and serving the nation in, and developing communications. So I think I would look to the past to try and understand what might happen in the future. The Archive Building is housed here in Hoban in a telephone exchange in London and we the building has been here since 1927, so it was opened as a new kind of exchange for London. The building still looks quite similar to the way that it looked when it opened in 1927, and we have photographs in the archive that can show us that. And we have the whole third floor of the exchange, so we're lucky that we have a research area, which is where we're standing now, and we have our archive strong room, so all of our collection is held here, the physical collection. We also have a huge digital collection. and. Um, the building itself has an interesting heritage, so we know that the first speaking clock equipment, um, which was a service launched by the post office in 1936, was housed here in this building. We have a, um, a post office magazine report that tells us that it was in the basement of the building, we're not quite sure where. Uh, and that service was launched in order that people could know the time, which might seem quite strange to us today because we have access to the time whenever we need it, but then um, operators were often being uh, called by people to ask them the time and so they decided that this would be a useful service and other services followed like dial a disc which was for music, dial a recipe and um, sports results so it was a way of helping people to um, get the information that they needed in a time before um, developments like the web. BT's archives can be described as our corporate memory so they tell us information about the story of BT and its predecessors over time um, so that will be things, for example, um, like decision-making records, governance records. It will be the way we presented ourselves to customers, so advertising material, marketing material. And then it will be what kind of innovations were we doing, what, what, was, um, what were we researching at the time. So we have a huge collection of research records. Um, our research reports and memoranda are registered as part of the UNESCO Memory of the World Register because they are very, very significant in the kind of information that they can tell us. Um, and we also have financial records, we have staff magazines, we have a huge collection of phone books going right back to the very first phone book in the UK from 1880. 
and we have a really big collection of photographs and films. So it's a very rich collection and it can really tell us about what was BT doing, what was the post office telecommunications function doing and what was the telegraph and telephone companies doing over our entire heritage which goes back to 1846. A few of my favourites from the collection are often the more visual pieces I really like, although the information in many files is just so interesting and significant. But one of the things I would draw out is this box of photography we have from the National Telephone Company, so very early on, um, late 1800s, early 1900s. And they took these photographs as a means of advertising what the telephone was to try and engage people. and Often they're quite aspirational, so there's a woman who's um, quite finely dressed, leaning against a mantelpiece um, on the telephone. There's a photograph taken in a hotel, a very opulent hotel, where there's a, a man on the telephone at the table, and the woman is sat opposite him, doesn't look very happy about this, so it kind of resonates with today, you know, people being on their phones, um, perhaps when they're in social situations. So I love those photographs. Another piece that I really like is a film that we have. We have a huge film collection and one film which was made in 1989 is called Mobile Telecommunications, um, The Future of the Phone. And it's very, it's both very 80s and very futuristic at the same time. It's looking at the mobile telephone at that point and so quite early on and looking at what the future might look like. And actually it was quite... It was quite correct, really, in what, in what was predicted. So there were things like you might be able to control the temperature in your home using your mobile phone, which, you know, is something that we're starting to see today. So um, I love how, how right it got quite a lot of the, um, the things. Some of the things it got completely wrong, um, but, it's, but it's quite an interesting film. Another one of my favourites is a folder, a file that we have in the collection that was produced in 1924. So the post office ran a competition to design the telephone kiosk, so the phone box, that could go outside. So it had to be a piece of, of architecture and a number of different firms submitted. And we have a file that shows you the different designs. And when you look at it, we know what the outcome was. We know the winner because it's such an iconic piece of, of design by Giles Gilbert Scott. But you see what, what might have been from this file. And I always think it's fascinating just to, to think how things could have changed um, and the kinds of designs that were being submitted at that point. A few statistics about our collection. We have in our physical archive, so the physical storage, we have 3.5 kilometres worth of storage. So if you put the shelves end to end, they would reach 3.5 kilometres. We have a huge digital and digitised collection. So for example, we have just over half a million digitised images from the collection that are available online. And in our catalogue, where we keep all the information about our collection, we have just over 185,000 entries. We have a huge collection of research reports in our archive, and one of them that I would highlight is from 1910. So it was the telephone apparatus designs for that would be installed in Scott's mission to the Antarctic, and it has both the research reports and the blueprints. One of the items in our collection is an early piece of advertising dating from 1877. So the telephone had been patented in 1876 by Alexander Graham Bell in the States, and then his agent bought over this piece of advertising to the UK to tell people what is this invention, how does it work, what does it look like? So there's a picture on it that says, half full size for the instruments that you would get and it tells you how much it would cost and it was very expensive at, at that time it was um, certainly not for everybody but it's a really nice piece of advertising material and it would then lead to the setup of the first company the year later in 1878. Our earliest document is the two patents that we have from 1837 and they were the design of the electric telegraph so it was the first practical design of a telegraph system in the world and the two inventors, Charles Wheatstone and William Fothergill Cook, are named on the patent. And we have these, um, one of them is particularly ornate with Queen Victoria, very young Queen Victoria, pictured on the top left. And then the seal at the base is actually the seal of William IV, because she was so new to the throne at that point, she didn't have her own seal created. 
So they're just very, very visual documents. And it's always amazing to think that was where it all began. And then that led to the development of the first company in 1846, the Electric Telegraph Company. Um, both of them were responsible for founding that. And then that's where we, we can date our heritage to. And that's why we'll be um, 175 years next year in 2021. So what I've got here is the first phone directory, the phone book that was produced in the UK. So it was produced for the telephone company, which was the first telephone company to be set up. And it was in Coleman Street in the city of London. And it's only six pages long. So you can also see that it has names and it has addresses, but there are no numbers because at that point you didn't need a number. So you would go directly to the exchange and the exchange would put you through directly to that person. And, um, and it's very, very thin. So this is the very first one. And the second one um, from February of 1880, so this one was 1880, January, this one's February, um, is very similar, but I do like the fact that at the back it has the private telephone exchange um, numbers, which were where people could install an internal telephone system. So no one could actually call them, but they could put a telephone system into their own home. And this was obviously the wealthy um, and some businesses. And so you have names such as Her Majesty the Queen and various Dukes and Lords. So it was very much a prestigious thing to be in the phone book at the beginning. Um, it showed that you had wealth because it was, um, as with a lot of technology, at the beginning it was quite expensive. So wherever BT goes, the archive will be capturing its history in the same way that we have since 1846. We'll be keeping the story of BT over its long and rich heritage.